This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. It's not possible, actually, in 20 minutes to explain all that much about evolution and altruism. This is a big and controversial topic, but I'm going to do my best to hit some high points for you to create a framework in hopes that some of the rest of the talks will make somewhat more sense. And I'll conclude by telling you why we will not be able to accomplish our goal, but why it's worth giving it a good try. Um, the goal, explain why humans have capacities for extraordinary altruism. Again, it, we're not trying to explain why some people are altruistic and others are less altruistic. That's an entirely different question. We're interested in why humans, as a species, have pro-social capacities not present for other species. Um, and I'm going to begin, really, by talking about what I consider to be a psychic trauma. Uh, you know, people have talked about the Copernican Revolution just warping people's minds when they finally had to accept that we were not, in fact, the center of the universe. And I think something almost as traumatic has happened in the 1960s when our notion of where our own morality came from was shattered by a series of discoveries that are still reverberating. And the, it, the conclusion is very, altruism exists because it pays off for our genes. That's the grand conclusion from the 1960s. And again, I consider this a moral trauma, and I think some of the debate in this field is because there's moral fervor that gets engaged by these issues. I do think we now understand sociality and cooperation enormously well, and it's amazing people don't realize that this is one of the fabulous advances of the 20th century. Altruism, however, still arouses some confusion. I think a lot of that confusion is because there's not one explanation, there are multiple explanations, and you're going to hear multiple different ideas presented this afternoon. Our task is to recognize that multiple ones can all contribute. I'm also going to emphasize one particular kind of mechanism that may be important and neglected, and that's social selection. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. So we begin with a metaphor that everybody knows about. At the end of winter in Scandinavia, the grass is all gone. And if all the lemmings kept eating the grass that was there, they would all die and the species would go extinct. So some of them jump into the fjord, sacrificing themselves for the good of the group. This is a metaphor that has stuck. I saw this on Walt Disney Television at age 10. And you will get to see it too. A lemming. Uh, lemming is a little. You know, somewhere in the back of my brain, I think I've heard that word, but I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I couldn't tell you if it was a little rodent, is a little monkey. Kind of like the raccoons. It looks like a little furry chinchilla. They wore these blue jumpsuits. They had yellow skin and I think kind of like this green tufty hair. I'm very confused about lemmings. <laughs> the lemming is, to my knowledge, is a bird, but... I don't know what to believe and what to not believe. In 1958, the Walt Disney Company released White Wilderness as part of their True Life Adventure series. That year, it also won the Academy Award for Best Documentary. By now, the lemmings have forgotten the original idea of food. They've become victims of an obsession, a one-track thought. Move on. Move on. Keep moving on. This is the last chance to turn back. Yet, over they go, casting themselves bodily out into space. Lemmings do not willingly jump into the Arctic Ocean, nor do they have an inborn instinct to die. A 2003 article by the New York Times 
revealed that the Walt Disney Company recognizes that the Lemming suicides were staged. Disney staged that scene? Wow, I didn't realize that. Um, yeah, I thought it was pretty believable. That upsets me. I don't like that. That's really not a documentary. They gave us that metaphor, though. They built it for us. In a sense, it's a public service, you know. I mean, what would, like I said, you know, there would be a lemming-shaped hole in the public discourse without lemmings. So, there would be a lemming-sized hole in the public discourse without lemmings. Now, that summarizes a great deal. Actually, what the Walt Disney people did is to hire Eskimos who trap lemmings, buy them, and bought all the brooms in the local village and swept them off those cliffs. You saw some of them made a great leap. Uh, they were assisted in their, in, in their <laughs> leaping. So it was George Williams, actually, in 1966, who published a book, Adaptation and Natural Selection, showing that this kind of thing was impossible biologically. A simple group selection does not work. His conclusion was that this lemming here would, in fact, stay back and pass on his genes. These lemmings would not. The logic was really as simple as that, and it completely transformed the study of animal behavior and biology. If altruism benefits others more than self, the genes responsible for this behavior will be eliminated. Before that, everybody thought organisms did things for the good of the group, and after that, they recognized that was wrong. This was traumatic, and here's the logic. If altruism means sacrifice for others, genes for altruism will be eliminated. And so genuine altruism cannot exist, unless, as Dawkins puts it in the last feeble paragraph of The Selfish Gene, we fight the tyranny of our genes. The key to this is that we've also discovered, immediately after this discovery, that there are explanations for why helping behavior exists. It pays off. It benefits your own genes that are in your relatives, or you get a payback later from the person you helped. You're actually acting in self-interest or mistakes and manipulation. Kin selection is the key to all of this. William Hamilton gets appropriate credit for this, 1964 and 65. Um, Belding's ground squirrels are a great example. They make alarm calls when a bird of prey shows up, risking their lives, but making benefits to the other individuals who, in fact, are their offspring and siblings. Uh, Peter Medawar um, was the person who, um, it was Haldane, sorry about that, uh, it was Haldane who, whose anecdote everybody has heard 10 times, but you have to hear it one more time on the chance anyone has not. In a pub with John Maynard Smith uh, back about 50 years ago, now 60 or so, he said, uh, somebody asked him, so would you give your life for your brother? And he says, no, no not for my brother, but I would for two brothers or for eight cousins. <laughs> and this nicely sums up the idea of kin selection. It was also recognized that a lot of cooperation happened between people who were not relatives. And Bob Trivers usually gets credit for explaining this based on reciprocity, although the idea has long uh, pre progenitors in, in social theory and, and political science. Bob Axelrod, my colleague at Michigan, has done lots of studies on prisoners' dilemmas. The basic idea is very clear. You do something for someone else. If you can trust them to pay you back, you both get a benefit. There's been increasing recognition just in the last 10 years that mutualisms are more powerful than was anticipated. All kinds of organisms help other organisms because both get a payoff. The oxpecker gets food from the ox, the ox gets parasites removed. The cleaner fish gets food from the gills of the fish and the fish gets parasites removed. The baker sells you a loaf of bread and you give the baker money. It all works by mutualisms. It's also important that there are mistakes. I mean, we don't any longer live in groups of 40 to 50, mostly kin, in small bands. Um, and so it's quite possible that doing very altruistic things is just a mistake because we're living in a different environment. And it's also very clear that people manipulate other people by saying, you're a member of this group. We need everyone to contribute to the team. Um, whether it's a work group or an academic group, when you hear that kind of thing, when somebody starts talking about, you need to do it for the team, you know you need to get your guard up. <laughs> Richard Dawkins brought this to public attention with his famous book, The Selfish Gene, the single most commonly read book introducing people to the study of evolution and behavior. Many people took the conclusion from that book that everybody and everything is inevitably selfish. Again, I think this book augmented the trauma. Are we agents of selfish genes? Is selfishness natural and therefore unavoidable? Is goodness just a strategy to benefit our genes? 
I worried about this quite a while. In fact, um, in, in uh, Matt Ridley's book on altruism and origins of morality, he gives a whole page describing how I couldn't sleep for a couple of weeks um, after first grasping this. I'm not the only one. A lot of people were really disturbed by this, and it led me to write a paper that's the favorite title I've ever used for any paper. The title is, Why So Many People With Selfish Genes Are Generally Pretty Nice, <laughs> Except For Their Hatred Of the Selfish Gene. <laughs> Where I give Richard Dawkins great credit, actually, for he did hedge his bets. He didn't say we're all selfish, but if you read the book, you come away with that impression anyway. So this is a traumatic inference. George Williams, my dear friend, recently deceased. We all miss him so much. It was a marvelous memorial service for him last month, and it was very clear that my impression of him as one of the most moral of men was shared by everyone. But what did he think about his own discovery? Natural selection can honestly be described as a process for maximizing short-sighted selfishness. I account for morality as an accidental capability produced in its bound the stupidity by a biological process that is normally opposed to the expression of such a capability. He was tortured by his own discovery. And then Michael Giesland is well known for his really <laughs> cynical quote, scratch an altruist and watch a hypocrite bleed. Uh, Richard Alexander, uh, a mentor to me and several other people here, wonderful evolutionary biologist, took this also to an extreme. Nearly all humans believe, he says, it's a normal part of the functioning for every human individual now and then to assist someone else due to the actual net expense of the altruist. There is not a shred of evidence to support this view of beneficence. So it's not just a few people. These are the leading scientists of our time, or a slightly previous time now, who all thought that altruism was impossible. And in the more popular culture, Chuck Colson, uh, previously famous for his political shenanigans and time in prison, who got Christianity, says, whatever it's called, the evolutionary explanation for altruism is basically the same. It's really selfishness in disguise. So I hope I've given you the point that this has really been hard on people. Uh, Citizens Against Altruism <laughs> has not gotten very members, however. Um, turns out that people who hold this philosophy um, don't organize themselves very well. <laughs> From my own perspective as a practicing psychiatrist, it didn't match with what I see. Um, in my practice, I see 10 to 1 neurotics versus sociopaths. People lying in bed at night wondering, did I offend somebody? Oh my God, what did I do? How can I please that person? And maybe it's just that people who come to my clinic are this way. But <laughs> I also observe people who think that love is impossible. And for them, that's true. And it's very hard to fix. I also see people who think everyone is selfish, and so they act selfish, and guess what? In their social circles, everybody is selfish. This is real social constructionism. It really creates social realities. Bottom line, altruism, if it's called selfish, is a fast-spreading meme that I think has the potential to corrode the social fabric. 20 years on, after all of this trauma, where do we stand? It's led to huge amounts of wonderful research, and we now understand cooperation. Altruism, I think, is mostly explained, and again, we're 90% of the way there. So don't misunderstand the disagreements in this meeting as suggesting we're not making progress. We're really most of the way there. But there is confusion, some debates, and it might be that something's been missed. I'd even claim that looking back in history, this is a wild claim, but it's fun, that the, year, the millennium, 2000, will be remembered as the time when people finally grasped that their social capacities that are so special were shaped by natural selection. And we're just on the cusp of understanding how we can organize ourselves. So quick explanations for cooperation without taking time. Kin selection, benefit to genes. Reciprocity, payback later. Mutualism, self-interest for both. Trait group selection, a new idea here, pairs altruists. And if you can get together with somebody who's altruist and not get cheated, you both do better. And cultural group selection, Pete Richardson will talk more about this before, a very powerful force for cultural traits increasing in frequency, which creates new selection forces which act on genes to further change the species, and he'll explain more about that later. The schema for all of these, though, is natural selection shaping organisms to worry about how they can get an advantage over others somehow. Again, altruism too, 90% explained, I'd say, but some confusion. And maybe we can't quite put it all together. There certainly is a lot of disagreement in scientific journals about all this. I'm going to summarize one slide each four kinds of confusion. This won't be enough to resolve it, but it'll help us. Um, this is in a paper by Flynn and Alexander. Semantic confusion, 
confusions about levels of selection and group selection, confusing proximate and evolutionary explanations, and secund monocausal explanations. This is a marvelous diagram from an article by West et al. in 2006 where he tries to lay out all the definitions for all the terms. And I was so glad to find this because I finally thought I could narrow, I could really get clear about what each of these was. And then I looked for another article by Lehman and another article by somebody else. And guess what? They too defined all these terms, but differently. So if you think you're confused, it's not just you. I'm going to offer you what I call fuzzy definitions. I don't want to argue about them, but I want us to have some shared sense that cooperation benefits both parties. Altruism is something that's costly that helps others. Commitment is a behavior that follows through on a threat or promise, even when following through is costly. And moral behavior is when individuals follow rules, even when that requires acting against self-interest. Confusion two, levels of selection. Um, levels of selection, group selection models, and kin selection models are constantly pitted against each other, and it's very clear that mathematically they can be transformed into one another. We should not be arguing about is group selection or kin selection correct, no matter what shows up in science last month. Group selection, use of the term, fosters a lot of confusion, just because it means so many different things, and I advise us not to use it. A West says in his nice review, an alternative is to say it as simply as possible what they really are, models of non-random assortment of altruistic genes. I want you to re remember that because that's the key to everything. Any mechanism that brings altruistic genes together can make altruism evolve. Confusion three, proximate explanations are about mechanisms. Evolutionary explanations are about how they got that way. And sometimes you see people writing articles saying, Altruism is explained by punishment. Well, punishment is not an evolutionary force, it's a mechanism. Or likewise, some people talk about you know, the amygdala being the key to altruism. It's necessary, it's part of the mechanism. It was shaped by natural selection to make morality possible, but it is not an evolutionary explanation, it's approximate explanation. And finally, confusion four, it's such human nature to advocate your own idea as more important than the others, and so almost everyone does, including me. Um, kin selection, reciprocity, levels of selection and social selection, you will find people talking mostly about those, even in our, our symposium today. And in fact, we need to try to keep them all re in recognition as multiple contributors. So are we there yet? Again, we now know how selection shaped mechanisms that mediate most altruism and cooperation. Is there anything that is still not quite fitting in very well? People do costly things for relatives from moral and altruistic motives. And the question is, how did we get those motives? It's not that we do them, that could be enforced by other things, but we have motives to feel guilt and pride and shame. The recognized answers for how these things can come about are mistakes and manipulation, extensions of reciprocity theory, trait group selection, and cultural group selection. And based on what I just said, these are all important, I think, explanations. The question is, is there anything else we want to consider as well. First, we better say, so what do we mean by altruism? Um, if we're talking about genes that result in behavior that decreases their own fitness, this isn't possible, forget it. If we mean genes that can shape motives for helping others, obviously people do help others, but that's easy to explain because there are benefits. Finally, if we mean can selection shape motives for a very costly helping without calculating individual benefit, the answer is maybe. The additional explanations I've tried to explain are commitment and social selection. I'm going to skip commitment because there's not time. Um, and refer to an idea by Mary Jane West Eberhard called social selection, which is exactly like sexual selection, except the benefits come not from getting a better mate or more mates, but from getting better partners and more partners. Peter Hammerstein, who's here, you'll hear from him in a moment, has I think the same idea, but he uses economic terms to talk about markets. So traits that make you a preferred partner result in more and better partners, which increases your Darwinian fitness, explains extravagant generosity, morality, and loyalty, and gives you a trait as huge as a peacock's tail. Mary Jane Westerberhard also went through and said there's runaway selection, just like the peacock's tail can get huge, our capacities for altruism can get huge and very costly. Again, we're not talking about sexual selection, we're talking about social selection, nothing different from natural selection, it's just a subtype of how it all works. 
These are selection based on cho social choices that al ends up associating altruistic genes, giving a huge advantage to each. It's a perspective shift. Now, we're no longer talking about organisms selected to calculate their maximum advantage and get it. We're talking about organisms shaped to care a lot about what other people think about them and to try to do everything possible to make themselves preferred partners and preferred group members. And in fact, that's what most of us do most of the time. The rest of the time, we're on selection committees trying to see which people really make it and which ones we want to choose as graduate students, faculty members, friends, or lovers. So to conclusion, how did all these pieces fit together? I wish it was as nice as this. With each piece, a nice little part of the puzzle we could put together, I think what we're going to find in the rest of today's discussion is that it's more like this, with the puzzle cut up in pieces that take multiple different overlapping chunks of the answer, and we'll see how well we can put it together. I hope it looks a little bit more like this by the time we're done. Thank you very much. Um, so as a, as a philosopher, I wanted to say a little bit both about the brain and um, how the mammalian brain in particular may contribute uh, and in, in very interesting ways uh, to social behavior. But I also want to say a little bit um, of a philosophical sort, both to sort of give uh, the discussion uh, a context. So Aristotle, in many ways, meshes very well, I think, with how we are beginning to think about morality in a scientific context. Um, although it was to about 250 BC when he thought these things, he felt that it was in our nature to be social and that it was advantageous for us to be social. He saw morality as consisting of very practical problems that needed to be solved at both the social and, in, and the individual level. And in that, really, he contrasted with Plato, who was very mystical in his conception of the nature of morality. Aristotle also thought that human well-being was a major target of uh, human values and that there were better and worse solutions to particular problems. And in that sense, he th thought that often there was a matter of fact of which solution uh, served well-being uh, to a greater extent. And finally, he really emphasized the importance of habits and culture and skills in acquiring wisdom as to how to make good moral decisions. Now, of course, part of what we really want to know is what is it about our nature that makes us social? Why are we social? And in particular, we want to understand where values come from. Now, I'm going to do this very fast, and for that I really must apologize, but um, the first point is really very simple, and that is, that is that all animals are organized to see to their own survival and well-being. We have mechanisms in the case of mammals and vertebrates. Uh, generally, we have mechanisms in the brain stem that ensure that when glucose levels fall or when carbon dioxide levels rise, uh, when there are certain other changes bearing upon temperature, that action is taken. And there is a kind of coordination of circuitry so that priorities are set and the animal does well. Now, that's sort of the basic story for vertebrates. But when we come to mammals, we get something really very different. Now, I'm going to suggest that uh, altruism or cooperativity in mammals is probably based in something rather different uh, from what it is in social insects. In mammals, in order to ensure that the dependent offspring are well cared for, it's as though the homeostatic ambit of the parent or the mother expands to include the offspring. So that whereas she must see to her own survival and well-being, with a similar care, she must see to the survival and well-being of the offspring. And so there is an expansion of meanness, as it were, to include mine. 
That would be, of course, initially the case uh, in early mammals. And we know a certain amount about that circuitry, although there's much about the evolution of the mammalian brain um, that is still not understood. One of the important things then is that when there is separation of infant from mother, there is anxiety, cortisol levels rise. When there is reconnection between the two, then oxytocin levels rise and cortisol levels drop and it feels good. So pain and pleasure are right at the root of the attachment and the bonding uh, between mother and infant. Now, of course, in certain uh, social animals, and very famously this is true of the prairie voles, uh, there can also be a bonding with mates. And we know something about how that occurs. So we know that the contrast between the uh, bonding for life between mates in prairie voles, which differs from montane voles, who don't really care very much about each other and aren't particularly social. The, the bonding and attachment is regulated, so far as we know, mainly by the density of receptors for vasopressin in the ventral pallidum and for oxytocin in the nucleus accumbens. And if you change those things, you change the behavior. Roughly then what it looks like is that the big change that gives you caring for others comes with the mammalian brain. And that smaller changes, tweaking a bit here, tweaking a bit there, can give you rather different forms uh, of social behavior. And it's interesting in the case of the prairie voles, but this is also true of marmosets uh, and some other species, but certainly also of, of birds, that uh, the males partake of the um, parenting. And an interesting result is that if you give a naive male prairie vole oxytocin, he immediately begins to parent uh, pups that happen to be nearby. He huddles over them, he licks them, he nurtures them, and so forth. So the hypothesis is that sociability is a basic value for social mammals and that it's rooted in caring. That the hub of the story has to do with oxytocin, but of course there are other neuromodulators uh, and neurotransmitters that play a crucial story, including dopamine, serotonin, and of course vasopressin, but also the endogenous opiates. This is all going to be augmented by the reward system so that the animal will learn the social practices and conventions as well as the individual ways of others in that particular group. And it will also change as a result of the elaboration and expansion of prefrontal structures. The fact is, of course, we don't know very much about what prefrontal structures actually do in detail. There is some understanding that they play a very important role in uh, social understanding and social cognition and also in impulse control. But at a detailed level, we don't really understand what they do and we don't really understand why there was such a great expansion of frontal structures in primates. Oxytocin is important. As I said, it's the hub, but only the hub of the story because it decreases defensive postures, it increases the level of trust, it decreases the level of autonomic arousal, and in general, it acts as a kind of safety signal. Now I'm going to switch gears and just remind us of something, because I am about to get into the philosophical bits. Uh, remind us of something that uh, we all learned in basic psychology but is easy to forget. And that is that our everyday workaday concepts have a radial structure, meaning that they have uh, exemplars or prototypes at the center where we, we all pretty much agree, for example, that a carrot is a vegetable. But then with varying degrees of similarity, uh, other things such as radishes or mushrooms, we may disagree about whether they are really vegetables. The boundaries tend to be fuzzy. This is true not just of a concept like vegetable, but uh, house, creek, river, mountain, and many other things. 
Now, the, I've introduced this here because I think social categories and indeed moral categories uh, also have a similar organization. They have a radial structure. So who counts or what it is to be a friend is not something that we define in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions. It's what the child learns by example. And similarly, what it is to be honest or to be kind or to be brave or to be trustworthy and so forth. Now, in, in talking about prototypes, of course, in, in the social domain, it's probably worth pointing out that the prototypes may well differ as a function of the ecology. So the basic platform for caring may be pretty much the same, but people are going to differ as to the particulars of what they count as being honest or being trustworthy. Just as in, in this slide, uh, that house may be considered prototypical by people who live in Michigan, uh, but in California, that would certainly not uh, be considered prototypical, but it would be for people living in the north. And I think we can see similar variations in cultural practices as a function of differences uh, in ecology. And I think that probably um, echoes something that Christoph Besch said in his talk uh, about chimpanzees. So, the other quick point I just want to make here, too, is that a very important way, which we often don't think is important, but I, I, I am become convinced is, of transmitting understanding to children about values and the prototypes of these categories, like honest and trustworthy, is via stories. So here, of course, we have the boy crying wolf. And we learn that deception is wrong. But here we have Briar Rabbit saving himself through a deception. You know, don't throw me in the Briar Patch, even though that's where, of course, he wants to go. Uh, here we have the, the ant and the grasshopper. And of course, we all know the grasshopper comes to a bad end because he's not thrifty and working hard. And, but we also are told that uh, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Part of the point here, too, I want to make is that we sometimes invoke a rule to a child, although this is much more a Western than an Eastern phenomenon. Uh, but even when we do so, we also at the same time are teaching the child about the deeper values and the deeper understanding and wisdom that will allow it to know when an exception is OK, when it is OK to deceive, when it is OK to lie. Now, a standard philosophical objection, which I shall criticize shortly, to all of this foray into morality from a scientific perspective is that it's, it's just descriptive. It's not really telling us what we ought to do. And the justification for this is usually uh, to invoke uh, St. David Hume and say, um, but Hume said you can't derive an ought from an is. And this is then followed up. And, and this really deeply characterizes most moral philosophy, although there are exceptions in the 20th century, that there are facts and there are values. And you cannot infer what is valuable from the facts, no matter how complex and rich they might be. You have to have a normative premise. And fortunately, we philosophers are just the guys uh, to provide that. <laughs> But it doesn't seem like it really holds water. And it partly doesn't, because it's clear that Hume himself did not believe that, because he went on in the book uh, to make all sorts of inferences about how, what we ought to do and how institutions ought to be structured. So let's take it apart. What does a derivation require anyway? Well, a derivation means you've got a deductively valid argument. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. That stuff. All humans have kidneys. Bill is a human, so Bill has a kidney. That's derivation. That's deduction. It can get complicated, but it still has that same character. But most of what we do 
most of the time, both in the physical and the social world, in making our decisions about what we ought to do, has very, very little to do with deduction. I actually think I can go through a whole week without making one deductive step. Now, Adam Smith and David Hume both said, and, and we learned this uh, a little earlier, and, and this, I think, really is echoed in the way we're thinking about values neurobiologically, that our nature set our basic values, and they constrain how we refine those values in particular ecological niches, whether we're living in the city, whether we're living in the country, whether uh, we are living in a very cold climate or not. Now, of course, part of the reason that people wanted to say that uh, Hume was the right smackdown for, for a, a scientific approach to morality was that it's quite true that something is not desirable just because it's desired. But that's at least in part because there can be conflicting goals. That is, I might have more than one goal and they might not mesh well, maybe because one is long-term, one is short-term, maybe simply because I'm conflicted. There's also the matter of the ignorance of the future, and there's risk assessment, and desires can change over time. So as a naturalist, that is someone who thinks that we can learn a lot about the nature of morality from understanding science in its broadest sense, uh, I shouldn't be sort of sucked into saying something is desirable just because it's desired. On the other hand, what is desirable, or what we ought to do, is not independent of what humans do desire. What our brains care about fundamentally does shape the ought space that we inhabit. And this is reflected in how we organize institutions, policies, and daily social behavior. Now, this contrasts, for example, with people who take the view that what we need to do on a regular basis is maximize aggregate utility. And here's how the conflict arises. Aristotle and I would say that you need first to take care of your own children. And then if you have additional resources, then uh, it would be fine to take care of 100 Haitian children. But if you take the view that your main obligation is to maximize aggregate utility, and this is actually adhered to both by Josh Green and by uh, Peter Singer, then you ought not to treat your own children as special. You ought to treat them as impartially as you would treat anybody else. I think that's biologically not possible. And I also think it's probably morally irresponsible. Um, so just to, to sort of sum up on this part then, uh, attachment and trust, I think, are the anchors of morality. But that doesn't give us very much of a specific sort as to uh, how we ought to behave in a given context. But, but they are the dispositions that contour the social problem space. They do also constitute the motivation to find good solutions to practical problems. And I'm assuming that given that we do have these uh, rather large uh, prefrontal structures, that they do help us in certain interesting ways to control impulses, to see a bit further into the future so that we can evaluate risk and consequences in a slightly better way than we might if we were homo erectus, and probably in ways that we really don't understand, mirror neurons notwithstanding, they probably enable us to attribute mental states to others in a much richer way than we could if we only had uh, a brain, let's say, of the size uh, of an australopithecine. So, Certainly problem solving is going to be part of the story. Culture, which I haven't mentioned here, is going to be a hugely important part of the story. But what I think is the basic platform for the story is what happened to mammals about 350 million years ago. Thanks.
So this talk is about partner choice markets and the evolution of cooperation. And uh, let me start by explaining what I mean by the term trade. Um, this is usually uh, supposed to be a mutually beneficial exchange of materials or services. And in some sense, one could say when something is mutually beneficial, it should occur. But uh, suppose that you see this basket of apple that you might buy from a farmer. And it would be nice for you to have these wonderful apples. And it would be nice for the farmer to get the money. But despite the fact that that would be mutually beneficial, there might be another deal. There might be another farmer having the same apples for a lower price or better apples and so forth. So an, a better deal may be possible with another partner. And this is the flavor of a market. This is the most essential feature of a market. Now, uh, markets do occur in principle in the animal world. But I will start with a fictitious example in order to show why it is interesting to look at the animal world in terms of markets. Here we see a fictitious boa. We called it the boa constructor because it's not a real thing. It's, and uh, the bird that you see is a shadow bird. They don't exist either. And our boa lives in a very hot area. It is very good at defending the eggs, but very bad at uh, providing shade, at pr protecting it from solar radiation. The poor shadow bird is very bad at protecting her eggs, but uh, she is uh, very good at shading them. So what would you expect to happen? You would to, uh, well, what could happen in principle uh, in, in evolution is that the boa allows the shadow bird to lay eggs um, together with uh, the boa. And, um, and then the bird would protect these eggs from solar radiation. Perfect deal. The boa defends the eggs, and they get shaded by the shadow birds. Now, when you look at this shadow bird, it has very, a very short tail. That's not so good for providing shade. Imagine that there would be variation among tail lengths in shadow birds, and that the boa would have a choice between different shadow birds. Of course, the boa now would choose the one with the longer tail. And as a result, you would see the evolution of elongated tails in the shadow birds. Now, why is this interesting in the spirit of this example? For example, partner choice could have promoted the evolution of pro-social pro tendencies in humans, despite the fact that these tendencies are costly. But the question is, have we ever seen the evolution of partner choice leading to um, a change in properties of other animals. And the, so what I want to do now is to give you an example, which is not exactly the shadow bird, of course. And um, when we thought about introducing the market idea in biology, this was together with Ronald Noe, um, we thought that maybe that a phenomenon described by ornithologists, namely delayed plumage maturation in male birds, um, that that might be driven by social partner choice. Now, how would that happen? Um, here you see a lazuli bunting, a very bright, brightly colored animal. And uh, what Green and others have shown is uh, that um, yearlings, I mean, males that are sexually mature, differ tremendously in their coloration. Some still look like kids, and others look like real adult males. And you wonder, why would a male want to look like a kid? And <laughs> so that is probably not very good if you want to be chosen by a female. Um, now here we see um, a situation out in the field. There's one, the, uh, the bird on the left is what I call the principle. This is only because I want to use some terminology from economics. In biological terms, he is. He, the owner of a territory, of a mating territory, and he's in control of what happens in this territory. Now, the other bird is uh, that I call the agent here because I want to relate this all to a theory called principal agent models in economics. The other bird um, is um, a yearling. And as you can see, 
the coloration is much less bright than that of the principal. So he gets permission by the principal to settle in the territory of the principal. And, but an, an important prerequisite for this is the dull coloration. The, the principals only accept dull looking males as social partners in their mating territories. These uh, males that I call agents here can attract a female. They are allowed to attract a female. That's, that's actually the whole point why they are permi get permission to stay in the territory. But they have to share the female with the principal. Not unheard of, by the way, in human societies. Um, and as a result, we think, now the, the interesting what Green and Al have shown is that these dull males, um, although they don't look very maleish, actually are fairly successful in terms of uh, the offspring they produce. Um, and so it seems to be advantageous to look young in these birds. And the funny thing is that social selection here drives the birds to have dull colors, whereas sexual selection would do exactly the opposite, as we have seen in many other examples. Now let's look uh, for a second um, how the buntings accomplish that trade. The important thing is that the principal dictates the terms of the exchange. It's in his, he has the power to enforce his interests. This is why he gets access to the other guy's female. And the agent, um, the dull looking male, pursues his own interest. Um, of course he is interested in mating, having offspring, and he will look after the offspring because at least some of the offspring is his. So they both look very much in their own interest. There is not much concern about others. There's no contract, and it's a fairly selfish behavior that explains this cooperation. Now, there are two things that I find important. First of all, that uh, what the agent uh, does by pursuing his own interest as a byproduct contributes to the principal's reproductive success. We often find that in cooperation, that what one of the partners does is, uh, is done for certain reasons, and as a byproduct, it helps someone else. And the other thing is that there's no contract. Now, an economist would be astonished to see this. Why do biologists talk about markets when there are no enforceable contracts? Because much of the conventional theory in economics is based on the idea that you can have a contract. Because only then can you bargain over what is the price uh, of this car when you want to buy it and so forth and then settle on something and then you will actually get the, par the car for this price. In the animal world there is no contract and whatever they bargain about the price doesn't matter because they wouldn't get it anyway, uh, perhaps. And uh, so I must come up here with a warning. In biology, the famous law of supply and demand that we are so used to, in, at least in textbook, uh, in conventional textbook economics, does not apply. And let me give you, um, instead, I mean, one has to really be worried about the question how can power be exercised? How is cheating controlled? What is the cost of changing partners? What do individuals know about alternatives? All these things, you really have to worry about what determines the terms of exchange. Only then can you start modeling this. You cannot rely blindly on something like a law of supply and demand. Now let me, let me give one well-known example that shows I mean, how far away you get from the law of supply and demand. And this is the, the mating market. I think I don't have to say what that is. Um, now, in, in, in textbooks, what you now find very often is a basic story that is boring because we've heard it so often that um, eggs are big, like in this case, <laughs> exaggerated, and sperm small. <laughs> and if you, if, you, uh, if you take into account that males and females exist in roughly equal numbers, then this has, of course, a, a consequence that very often what we would observe in populations is an excessive production of sperm. And if you look at mating from a market point of view, we would say there is a, an exchange that takes place. The, 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 the male gets uh, eggs to be fertilized, and the female gets sperm to fertilize her eggs, and so forth. But there is this incredible, ex incredibly excessive overproduction of sperm, and that as an, as an economist, you would say, if there were enforceable contracts, females could easily ask a high price from their mates. In biological reality, 
this gift seems often rather paltry. And uh, females may even receive a poison instead of a diamond, as we see it, for example, in fruit flies, where males inject a protein that is good for the male because uh, the, he will father more offspring of this female, but the female over her lifetime will have fewer offspring, which she doesn't care about. So I think that the animal world demonstrates impressively how narrow the scope for cooperation becomes in the absence of enforceable contracts. Now, the, absible, the absence of enforceable contract does not mean, of course, that there is no sanctioning in nature. We heard already some examples today. Um, so let me go a little bit. But then you have to really worry about what is the nature of the sanctioning, what, what is possible, what is not possible. And um, in evolutionary ecology, people got very interested in, for example, in mutualisms uh, like the one between leguminous plants and uh, bacteria. These bacteria fix atmospheric nitrogen inside what's called root nodules. Let me just show what these things look like. And they get something in return from the plant. So this seems uh, to be a mutually benefit. I mean, it's a mutualism. There's no question about that. And what people have done is they have, for example, made experiments to make it impossible for the bacteria to fix the nitrogen and ask, I mean, how would the plant react to that? And the plant then abandons that part of the root system. Um, and, uh, and people have interpreted that as uh, sanctioning. But there is now, in, in, in the current literature, people are worried that this might be a wrong interpretation because a plant always would abandon tissue that doesn't work properly. You always see when, when a branch is damaged or so, you see it will be a dead branch. That is the most normal thing for the plant to do to just give up parts of it that don't work properly. So, so the, what, what's called sanctioning here did not evolve for the purpose of sanctioning these uh, bacteria. It probably evolved as a very general feature of the plant to deal with any kind of damage. Perhaps the effect is a little stronger in, uh, in the presence of these bacteria, but nobody has shown this. So here again, we see that something that seems to be functional in, the, in, the, in order to make cooperation work is only a byproduct of something else. Now I come uh, to another example of uh, altruistic sanctioning. I actually, I come to an example of altruistic sanctioning, since we talk about altruism here. And uh, you will first not even see what on earth this has to do with altruistic sanctioning because I talk about indirect reciprocity. Indirect reciprocity is a principle where, where you would say, for when others are in need of help, um, give aid, help them, but restrict your help to those recipients that have a positive reputation, being good guys, well-behaved. And this is, in some sense, a, this is also a form of partner choice, because when people act like this, then you will see all this aid giving among those who are good guys and the bad guys will not receive aid because now um, this is one way of how one might explain um, what looks like altruism. And it was, I think, uh, first uh, suggested by Dick Alexander, whose name we heard several times today. Um, and um, Robert Sugden then, uh, Sugden then um, gave it the first formal treatment that was not widely recognized. And then Martin Novak and Carl Sigmund came up with a model um, that uh, where they tried to show how this can work. Let me go quickly into this. Uh, what Novak and, and Sigmund did was um, they looked at a specific updating rule for the reputation, which was as follows. Suppose that someone is asked for help. First of all, you are born with a neutral reputation. And then if you are asked for help and you don't help, others watch that and you, your reputation uh, goes down by one, for, by one unit in the mathematical model. On the other hand, when you are observed to help, your reputation increases by one unit. That was their model. So very simple, as a very simple way of updating the reputation. If you help, you score a point. If you don't help, you lose one. And then they tried to convince the community 
that, uh, that this kind of strategy would be an evolutionarily stable strategy that you would expect to find. Uh, actually, they did simulations to, sh to show that. But they did this simulation in, a, in an extremely small population that consisted only of 100 individuals, the, the entire population. And then randomness, random effects play a major role in, in what you see as the outcome of such a simulation. Uh, Ole Lema and I repeated these simulations, and what we found was that in a decently sized population, the whole phenomenon disappears. These strategies are not stable. They will not evolve. They will not be maintained in evolution. And the main reason is because uh, the updating rule that they use leads to altruistic punishment. Why is that so? Now suppose that I'm asked for help and uh, I'm supposed to help someone, say Randy, and, and Randy has uh, a bad score, he is below zero in this case. Of course, <laughs> in reality it's the opposite. Um, now if, if I then decide not to help him, it looks as if this would be good for me because I, I don't have to pay the price of helping him. But in your eyes, by not helping Randy, I lose reputation. And in these models, that effect is stronger than, um, than this what I would gain by not, by not uh, providing the help. And so, so there is an altruistic element in their story that they completely overlooked in the first place because they had this very small population where the mathematical model goes bananas and something. Um, now, Sagden had already given the problem a profounder treatment. And uh, we also uh, worked a little more on this. And the, the most important point here is, I mean, he talks about good and bad standing, just two different states in which you can be. And the important point is that the, donor, the donors who do not help a recipient in bad standing just keep their good standing. This is Now, one could say, doesn't this solve all problems? But the point is that. Um, what we can see is that the logic of indirect reversible either, either requires altruistic sanctioning, that was the Novak and Sigmund model, or when we follow Sagden, it requires high cognitive skills because now you always have to worry, okay, Peter didn't help, and, but how about Randy? Is he really a bad guy or so? No, he, of course he's not, he's a good guy and so forth. So there's confusion about all these things. And it's much harder to play the strategy that Sagden suggested. And this brings me to my final slide. <laughs> I'm a good guy, you know. <laughs> and yeah, I think uh, that uh, there, there is one problem with uh, understanding cooperation and altruism. As humans, we are born to be virtuous musicians in a social concert. And this very fact makes it very difficult for us to understand what it takes uh, to be social and to make the social concerts uh, sound so well. In the animal world, I think we often have uh, just, uh, it's, it's amazing how little it takes to get certain forms of cooperation to work without cause concern about others and all this. And we are so deeply into this that we can hardly imagine such a world to exist. Um, I think that's also one of your messages and we have to understand these little building blocks. Well, thank you.